We've got Dr. Jan Kupek, um, also from Sierra, who's going to be talking about geotechnical issues. Um, we've got Ethan Stetson from Christchurch City Council, who will be talking about some um, uh, Section 124 notices and who has other um, uh, um, information, community information, and some information on um, retaining walls as well. Um, and then we've also got um, Bruce Empson from EQC this evening, who also will talk a little bit about retaining walls um, and around um, land assessments and the other work that EQC is doing as well. So it'll be good to hear from all of those different facets of the, um, the, the groups involved in the recovery, the agencies involved in the recovery. Now, as I mentioned, retaining walls is going to feature in a couple of those presentations this evening. Okay, so, I mean, the purpose of this meeting is to try and um, improve our communications around um, the white zone and the section 124 issues that um, have plagued you people. Um, a lot of your lives have been extremely difficult for a long period of time, and for a lot of you it's become um, almost intolerable. So we're here to try and answer as many of the questions we can. Um, the people we've got here tonight are sort of people who, who either know, and if they don't know, then it's like the knowledge doesn't exist. So we've tried to get everybody here who actually has got as much knowledge here as possible. Um, I think there's been some sort of concern about the Port Hills ground truthing work that's been done. So Jan is our senior technical um, geotech person who works for us at Sarah, and he's here to try and answer, talk about that. There's the agenda, meeting purpose. I think I've got the meeting purpose stuff across. Um, Roles and, roles and responsibilities of the organisations, I'll talk a bit about that. Um, I'll talk a bit about the timeline, um, the policy, frequently asked questions. We've got a technical presentation from Jan. I'll talk a bit about the community support. Um, and then we've got Ethan, who's a senior person from the City Council, talking about sort of section, some of the issues around Section 124 notices. EQC here, Bruce Emerson's um, one of their senior people. And then we've got time at the end for questions. So I guess I was going to say, just before I really kick off, you know, the key, one of the key things we want to get across in this meeting is we want to get the zoning stuff done by the end of June. So people here who are white, we should know that you're no longer going to be white by the end of June. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the end of it. And I guess a frustrating thing for some of you is going to be when we get to the end of June, um, we may know that it's, um, your, your house is going to be OK to go back into, but it may be that some protection works might be needed. So here what I said, might be needed. So there may be this very frustrating thing. By the time we get to the end of June, we may still need to do physical work to go build stuff to get people back in. But what we're trying to give you is a, a, a picture of what we're doing to try and make that happen as quickly as possible. Um, I think the other, the other point um, that has been coming up at meetings is that um, some of this policy stuff about if we build walls or fences to stop rocks, no, we haven't made decisions on who would pay for those, partly because we don't know the quantum or the scale of them, and we also don't know how long they're going to take to build. We don't know about their cost effectiveness either. Um, but maybe I should just go through these roles and so on, and then we can get into sort of the more, more, of, the, more of the guts of it. So um, Section CCC, the Christchurch City Council, um, it was their responsibility around the Section 124 notices, um, the red stickers, um, and they've done that from the very beginning. The City Council is an established organisation. They, they, before now, before this, before this series of events, they issued Section 124 notices, so they've, they, they've had experience in doing it before. They have those powers. But also, when these Section 124 notices were originally issued, Sarah didn't really exist. So Sarah, the organisation that I run, has really only been operating since, um, well, a lot of the people only started coming on in June and July. So we just weren't an organisation that could manage all that stuff. So the CCC has also um, coordinated the emergency works in terms of lifelines, roads and those sorts of things. Um, so Sarah, my responsibility is we try and we lead and coordinate the recovery. Um, we do the zoning stuff. So in terms of that, if you like, that delineation, um, CCC is the Section 124 notices, and we do the zoning work. EQC provides insurance cover, um, along with the private insurers. And I guess I'd also make the point here that while I'm a, you know, I, I run Sarah, I don't have a, all the decision-making rights. 
a lot of those decision making rights go back to the cabinet. So the cabinet still has, you know, a lot of that key power. Skirt, script, the stronger Christchurch infrastructure rebuild team, which is about an organisation that's really um, involves the city, Sarah and New Zealand Transport Agency, they're responsible for rebuilding the infrastructure. So the white zone. Um, the white zone was originally determined by um, where the city council had bought section 124 notices, bought large numbers of them. Um, EQC were doing um, work understanding what those, what those risks were out there. Um, and, and the CCC were originally the people that got this Port Hills geotechnical group going. But the other, the other input into this process has been um, GNS, the Geological and Nuclear Sciences, who are the, the government crown research institute that you know, does geophysical stuff. They've done, a, they've done work. Um, and they also that work has also been reviewed by a bunch of sort of national but also international people as well. So there's the end of June there. And this slide here says progressive rezoning. So we want to be doing rezoning as that information comes to hand. What we're saying is we want to complete the rezoning and complete the policy work about who pays for what and what happens if you can't stay in your house. We want to get that done. We make a commitment to do our very, very best to get that done by the end of June. Playing into those time frames, is um, this is uh, the work that's being done by, is that the GNS and the ground truthing work, yeah? The GNS and the ground truthing work, and there's a big 3D rockfall study that Sarah has commissioned. So there's some major bits of analytical work trying to understand, um, that's feeding into that, into that zoning stuff. The other thing I've said at the other meetings is that it's, I think it's, it's quite possible, it's quite likely, that when we get to this date here, some people um, will know a lot more about what level of life risk they face or what level of risk they face by these big rocks or, or by these cliffs. And what I've said is what I want to do is try and lead a conversation. So if there's make up a number, just making up a number, and I'm going to get myself in trouble for make up a number, but there was a one in 5,000 chance you're going to get killed in your house in the next year. And we think, therefore, it's rational that some protective measure gets built. And that protective measure is going to take this long to, to build I'm really keen, we lead a discussion to try and get people back into their houses if they want to go back in when they know more about what that life risk is. I think it's been harder at the moment when we just know there's life risk without knowing more about the quantum of that. So I'm not, I can't say that will happen. I'm saying I will take responsibility to try and lead that discussion to try and make that occur. I also know when I stand up at meetings and say, look, to get, you know, a lot of this is trying to get people back into their houses, there's some people who don't want to go back into their houses either. You know, some people just want resolution so they can move on, and we want to get those decisions made as quickly as we can. There are a lot of similarities between the hill issues in terms of people not being able to stay in their houses with the flatland issues, but there are also differences as well. And that's why the government hasn't yet made a decision on how, you know, what it will do with people who can't go back into their houses. But the government's very aware of the similarities between this and the flatland where people have been made offers to voluntarily leave. <coughs> so people wanted to ask at some of the other meetings about the this, this policy stuff that, that goes into how we think about these issues. Um, there's the City Council GNS studies. Um, there's the work that we've, we're getting get done that Jan's going to talk in more detail about, these fancy 3D rockfall studies to really try and understand more about where these rocks might go. Um, and I guess another input is obviously just the work being done by GNS about what are the chances of us getting another shake here um, in the next year. We're also trying to think about the insurance situation. The insurance situation in some ways, on the, in the areas, these areas we've got rock for risk, is subtly different to um, the insurance situation on the flatland. If you've got a house where you know if there's another magnitude 6, it was very likely to suffer further risk. And that's been one reason why houses may have been zoned red. The insurance companies aren't all that keen to want to carry on insuring that house because they know the, 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 the probability of paying out is so high. They don't like those sort of risks. But insurance companies are less worried about a house where they think there's a one in a thousand chance you're going to get $30,000 worth of damage sometime in the next hundred years or something. That's a, a much lower level of risk compared to the risks they've got on the flatland. We're very aware about the social impact of all the stuff that's gone on for so long, communities that have been pulled apart for a long period of time. Some of the other meetings people have said to me, you know, if it was going to be 
what's a reasonable period of time for, to put up a fence if that was going to be something that was a good thing to do? What's a reasonable period of time before that was just too long? And I don't have the answer to that question, but I know 10 years is too long, but I know another week would be too short. And I think we need to work with communities to work out what is a reasonable time frame for, for that, some of that stuff to occur. The cost of these remediation measures, um, Jan will talk about that, but we have been active. Jan and a number of his, I was say his mates, a number of his colleagues have been to Europe to look at what's happened there. We're trying to understand how much these things cost and, what, and how long they take to build. And I guess the other thing is about, you know, in some areas, the infrastructure, about how, whether we keep roads open and those sorts of issues as well. I thought I'd jump to some frequently asked questions, just to sort of preempt some things. Um, why is it taking so long to get an answer on the white zone? Well, hopefully at the end of tonight you've got a better appreciation of that, but one of the reasons is it's just there's a, there's a lot of it. You know, there's a lot of white zone stuff in Christchurch, there's a lot of cliffs, there are a lot of places where rocks come down. It just takes time to bring all that information together. Um, a lot of it is about life risk, and life is a very special thing, so we want to do it properly. But maybe, hopefully, you'll have a better appreciation of that at the end, and if you're not happy with that, we can, let's ask some questions. Um, reasonable time frame to remediate an area, have I answered that enough? I, think, I don't have an answer to that, but I think a lot of people are getting fed up. But also, a lot of people actually want to stay as well, so how do we find a balance there? Why can't we see the draft GNS reports and maps now? Well, Jan will give you some sort of, in, some sort of snippets of some of those tonight. But our overall concern about putting draft reports out is they are just that, they're draft reports that experts are still reading and changing and saying, look, you've got this number wrong or that can't be right. So we do have an overall concern. If we put a draft report out and we give them to people, people will then analyse and go, well, do you look at this, this is terrible or look, look at this, I'm safe. And they'll jump to conclusions when it's too early to jump to conclusions. And I know there's a, there's a counter argument saying, look, just put it all out there. But we think at times in the past when we put draft reports out, the media have taken them and put a whole lot of headlines in the paper and it's made people's lives, we think, even more complicated. What happens if my green zone house is exposed by the removal of a red stickered property? So there's a scenario where there's rocks up here, there's a red zone house here, and you live down here. The risk is that this red sticker house, if it, at the moment it's acting as a shield, if you like. So there, are, there may be cases where these shields are removed and the houses further down end up getting a red sticker. So I'm afraid the safety thing there is where we're going we're gonna to come back to, I'm afraid. And the last one is about that section owners. So section owners, will they be compensated if an area wasn't going to be able to be built on in the future or whatever? I don't have an answer for that. I also don't have an answer if you own a whole lot of vacant land in Brooklyn's or Bexley or one of those other places either. The government simply hasn't made a decision there. So I can't tell you, I can't hint about something because it'd be wrong for me to hint when no decision has been made. I simply don't know the answer to some of those things. One thing, well, well, one thing we are trying to make sure people do get help when they need it. Um, the easiest way to find out where you can get some help if you want to go to a single phone number or a single website is go to our website, 0800 Ring Sarah, which is 746, uh, 746 423, or www.sarah.govt. But overall, um, there's about 50 um, earthquake support coordinators who are out there in the community, and they're not councillors as such, but they're people who have been in bottom place so they can direct you to where you can get particular help or try and act as pointsmen. So they're Intelligent people who know where you can go off and get help. Um, the CERA website has got a Port Hills page to try and give you information. Um, we're trying to also recruit relationship managers to try and um, um, work with particular community groups and communities so you've got one person within CERA who you can go to if you've got a particular frustration. Um, we've got an earthquake assistance centre set up at the Avondale Golf Club if you really like the face-to-face -face interaction. The Avondale Golf Club is um, pretty much in that red zone area, but there we've got people from EQC, from um, the insurers, from us, and they can, from community law, and they're at one place so they can try and be at one source of information, and I think that's actually going pretty well. So with no further ado, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Jan Kupik, who's our senior geotech um, engineer. Welcome, Jan. Thanks, Roger. Uh, welcome tonight. Look, uh, I want to split my presentation in two parts because um, 
when we presented in the other venues, the question was, look, why am I still in the white zone? How have you determined the white zone? And, uh, you know, on that kind of flows on what the zoning decisions are. So that's the first part. We're going to spend five, ten minutes on this one. And then I'll show you some of the graphics which we actually have generated from the 3D Rockfall study. And I'm going to talk a bit about the GNS study um, so and how these two studies interlink and what actually they will produce and what we will use in the policy development, which uh, Roger said, is what's actually uh, going to be put forward to the minister and to the cabinet to make a decision upon, okay? Question, why still in the white zone? And uh, what we actually did uh, initially, we just wanted to produce a plan. But the problem was with plans, not many people, unless they actually do full-time work and actually engineers, cannot read the plans properly what they actually mean. So what we have done over here, we used a 3D terrain model. We actually have a look and generate a model from LiDAR survey, and actually it represents what's on there. We put containers along it, just to indicate to people from somewhere where they are. So what you see over here is actually uh, Dean's head along Peacock's Gallop. Some of the information we hold at the moment is, for example, the crack data. So over here, you can see a whole raft of red lines, okay? And these red lines individually may not be a problem, but actually, if they come in the entire series as they are over here, they actually may be a problem. So at this particular stage, we believe is actually a slight. So we have two issues over here in this particular area, which may not be apparent even on the ground or of a singular plan. So we have over here a significant cliff collapse issue. We have over here a landslide. And strange enough, we have another one on the other side. Okay? So this is some of the information we use to determine where the white zones are. Okay? So it's not necessarily plans or engineering judgment or field trust, but it's more... 3D visualization, data management, and a lot of people ask us, well, could we have a geotechnical report for my property? In most cases, it doesn't exist as a written geotechnical report, uh, but actually is data collected on a GIS system, which is generally being something with my iPad, where you can run down the information, pull it out for uh, it, and it consists of layers into it. So it could be some information about boreholes, Cracking, there could be a rock fall, boulder fall, land damage, infrastructure damage, and so on and so forth. So this is the information which we actually use to determine the white zone. Now I'm going to show you an example how we have done that in um, December. Now, what we actually have over here is actually the individual building footprints. We have then over here the main roads. And it's at the moment irrelevant where it is, the process was the same for all other areas, okay? So we actually look at areas, and then um, we have over here houses with section one to four, these are the little red diamonds over here. And initially, everything was a white zone. And then the white zone was reduced by putting actually into the green zone properties that did not have any houses on them, or that were rural, okay? What was left were essentially residential areas. In order to reduce them further, we actually had to understand what is or is not at risk from a geotechnical hazard. So some advice was provided by the Port Hills Geotechnic Group, which is working for the Crash City Council. Some of this was provided by EQC. Some information was provided by international experts who were working over here, and some from GNS. And GNS said, look, based on the model we have developed at that particular date, which is suburb-wide, not house-specific, we believe that a rock coming from a certain area will only go up to that point. And these points over here is essentially these blue lines. So we have a rockfall source somewhere up here, and GNS believed with a certain type of modeling that what they believe is that no boulder will go past this line. And from this side of the hill, no boulder will go past this line. Okay? So we were then straight away able to say, right, clearly the areas which are at no risk are the one here in the middle, okay? And then we said, all right, let's delete a bit more closer. And you can see, for example, this house over here has a building footprint still encroaching into the area which may possibly be hit by a rock. The one thing which I say over here is this model over here 
I call it quick and dirty, okay? Does not consider, for example, other houses which are up the, uh, the hillside. Doesn't consider roads, highways, forests. So it's a method to very quickly determine on the entire Port Hills what is and what isn't at risk by simply saying, if there would be just a grass slope, how far the boulder would have run, okay? And doesn't mean that if you're sitting in this house, it's a particular bad spot because a boulder would have to actually find its way amongst all these houses into here. But it's the technical information we had available at that particular time, okay? And that's how uh, it enabled me to actually make a decision what's green and what's white, okay? And that's for rockfall. We have cliff collapse data. We have landsliding data, okay? And some of the information which came out, and this is right now in Morgan's Valley, in Heathcote Valley, and it's a very, very busy slide, so I'm going to give some explanation to it. First of all, where are we? We are roughly down here. That's the tunnel entrance over here. Then the state highway runs through here past Heathcote Valley, the malt works are over here, which are being demolished at the moment, and we have Morgan's Valley actually in here, okay? And the information on these slides is, first of all, you can see a lot of blue boulders in here, and um, they own ID number, right. First information, which is very important to this one is, if you go at the moment to the council website under Port Hills, there's a link to 180 maps which show all the boulder position on the Port Hills recorded by the Port Hills Geotechnical Group. So that data has been available based on feedback from the community. You would like to see the data, all right? <laughs> that data is over there, and I need to actually put a caveat onto it, all right? And it's very, very simple. Who here believes that the geotechnical engineers were out with a mission to uh, check every single rock on a 14 kilometer land, um, side? We didn't, we couldn't. Because if you would have, if this is what you want us to do, can we have 10 years? Because that's what it will take. So what we have done is actually looking at best engineering practice and we looked at representative data sets. Okay, so if you look in there and you pull it up and say, oh, look, there is no rock shown above my area. You know, what is that about? Okay, have they not been there? It was probably done that we actually went to the neighboring property or the neighboring site and said, look, this one looks very similar to this one and the geology over here is very similar to the geology over there. So let's focus really in detail, catch what's happening on this hillside and then will be a representative to the other hill side. And that's normal engineering practice, especially if you're actually dealing with about 14 kilometers of ridge line, okay? So don't panic if you don't see rocks. Also don't panic if the area above your property is completely peppered with rocks, okay? Doesn't necessarily mean anything. Because the one thing over here, not every dot is essentially a boulder. We can in our database click on it and determine whether we're talking about a head size boulder, a washing machine size boulder, or half a cliff. That unfortunately is not represented over in these photos. Again, a dot means information on this location has been collected, okay? So one example of which I give, which I give in Sumner, if you look at Habitant Avenue, it looked like URS, which were the consultant who did a really, really good job because absolutely covered the dots. Okay, look like on the other side, there's one area which wasn't been done and the other one has on sporadic boulders. It was a different method to collect the data by that consultant. And it was not that they done a better job than the other one, it was a method in the madness, okay? So there's a method behind it, okay? And I'm gonna go to the method later on. But, so not every blob over here represents a rock, it could be something more. So that's the first information. Second, you can see there's a lot of blue lines and a lot of green lines. They're over here, over here, and over there. Wherever these lines are is where the pilot study of GNS has been undertaken. Very similarly, that we didn't want to have GNS spending all the effort to do every single section and cliff and bluff on the Port Hills. We said, you need to focus in specific areas on rockfall issues, so and the same with cliff collapse. So you have to go between here and there. This is representative to what's left and right. This is your pilot study area, okay? And obviously in Morgan's Valley over here, 
you can see there is no boulders, no points actually collected over here. Because actually from a health and safety perspective, no one was game to go up there, okay? But what we did do, we did down at the bottom, and you can see there's a whole ring of little blue dots all around over here. So these are the boulders which were arrested by the existing protective system, which was over there, which is a small fence and a bund, okay? And, and a little road. But equally so, what we do have is all the boulders that actually have penetrated and came down on there. So that's pretty much the information which is contained in here. So we have the top of the bluffs, which is in blue, and we have the bottom of the bluffs in green. So all this area in between is still being seen as a rockfall source. All right? So that's just the complicated information behind it. The other one, green, is obviously um, Sierra Green. And green means you will not get a government offer. That's what green stands for. Now, so that's the information over here. As you can see, for example, over here, the GNS study indicated the runout area for the rocks is roughly over here. Again, what I said, what it hasn't considered is the little fact that there is actually a 25 meter wide flood bench with a little fence at the end called the state highway. Okay? So it's actually quite good if you live over here. Despite the fact it's in the white zone, it's actually very well protected. This is one of our key lifelines out of Littleton to get goods out, okay? A lot of uh, um, protective works have been undertaken over here. We have a couple of fences over here. A couple of these bluffs have actually been meshed, okay? So again, not necessarily at risk, but at this stage, where this rezoning was undertaken, that was the best available data we had at hand. Okay? Now, that's Morgan's Valley and Heathcote Valley. If I go to Littleton, uh, and a delivery actually made it large to actually catch areas over the two bays and Littleton itself. Very similar thing, which I showed at Heathcote Valley, was undertaken over here. The complexity over here was, if you actually look up it, Littleton sits in a little bowl. So there's a lot of fingers which are actually the little gullies, which do focus and concentrate where the rock's coming to, okay? So little is a bit more complicated <laughs> than the reminder of the port hills, okay? So what we have over here, instead of actually looking at the individual one, you can see the little round blobs over here. And these are the large bluffs which are actually sitting up there. Again, people didn't go up there, but we did an uh, inspection from a helicopter. We use LIDAR information. We use high-resolution aerial photographs. We use satellite images. And all this information was collected to actually feed into this one over here. Okay? And when GNS gave us some indication about the runout areas, it was very clear that, for example, nothing will run into here. So that was with green. Where we had perception that things actually still at risk, I brought the green zone back as far as we could. The rest is at the moment in the white zone. At the moment, the ground through thing is going on, which is my second part of the presentation, to dealing it further these areas. Again, in Littleton, the, this area only was part of the pilot study. This was not and there was no pilot study outside Littleton apart from Rapaki over here. So you can see, it doesn't mean that there are no boulders over here and that there is a large number of boulders over here. It just means this was investigated in much more detail because we know that there is actually a rockfall has happened in here. These are the runout lines. And because this area is very similar to this area. Okay? Just to give an idea, for example, at Rapaki, it took a team of seven people, two and a half months to collect this information, okay? So it's a lot of intense work, which you can see on the port hills. Now, look, second part of my presentation is tell you about the studies. And these studies essentially um, both feed off each other. They're commissioned by two different entities and they have different outputs, but in a sense, both of them feed into the policy making decision. And it's not to be understood that CCC have engaged GNS and as government agent, we came along and then engaged something flusher or better. It's not the case. It's just both of them give us different things. Now, GNS over here essentially look at risk, okay? The one fundamental problem with risk is 
that most people don't understand what risk actually means. And I'll just do a different example. If I tell you that window over there is 25 meter tall, you will know straight away if actually something's not right in there, okay? If I would tell you that you, if you jump out of the window, you have a one in a million chance of actually dying, or a one in a hundred thousand chance of dying, you actually have no relationship whether that's a really dangerous place to be or not, okay? So, GNS gives risk, and risk is really, really good to be used in a long-term hazard management perspective. Looking at what will happen to the land, not necessarily in the next six weeks, 12 months, 20 years, but actually for much longer times. Because the one thing is, we don't want to put people in the houses and in a year time or five years time or 10 years time being in the same problem again, okay? So this is looking at the more larger issues and is generally on suburb wide. And in order to deal in these colors over here, the GNS and Portals Geotech teams go out there and actually look how these risk lines relate on the ground. And it's a certain process, which is very technical. I don't want to go into detail at this stage. If you're interested, catch me afterwards, okay? Now, what we have done, we used with a Christchurch company, GeoWord, and they're working with an Australian specialist called Freefall at the University of Milan to use a different approach. Okay, and this approach is essentially a 3D study. So, and the 3D study can be done on a suburbite scale, this is Wakefield Avenue, or it can be done on an individual scale, very much easy. And the nice thing it provides is nice graphical outputs, which I can show you, and they're actually much easier to understand, okay? Now, what is the study all about? You probably ask, and you're right, I have this slide over here. Okay, now, what it does, it's a numerical simulation or a computational model. Now this model, first of all, hasn't been available over the 10 years ago because in order to run it, we need a university mainframe, which is a very large computer. We don't have anything like this in Australia or New Zealand, so that we actually had to go to the University of Milan, which actually used some of the fastest computers in Europe to run this analysis, and it takes per section of area, and Littleton subdivided in three bits, about a day each, okay? Now, what we do is very simple. What we do, we, we create the model in a digital terrain, which represents it to a fairly high accuracy using LIDAR survey. And LIDAR is essentially an airplane flying around and surveys to a great accuracy the terrain. And the terrain actually is fairly amazing and it's much better than I show over here. Okay? So you can literally pick out individual boulders in a LiDAR picture. That's being used and then with a computer we throw rocks from a source up there. It could be over here, could be here, could be somewhere else. Okay? And we don't throw one rock down there, we do several million down there. And the rocks have different shapes. They can be perfectly round, slightly oblong, plate sized, you know, cubic, and they could be very small, could be very large, could be very, very large, okay? And we see graphically what actually happens. And for example, one of the outcomes over here, we actually do consider things like individual houses. What happens if this house is being struck by a rock avalanche or individual boulders? What you can see, there's actually a fan in the back which protects the house underneath it which in fact, that's a really what happens, okay? Now, first of all, if you wonder where the hell that is, or whether it's my neighborhood, it's actually a little village in Italy, all right? So no panic. <laughs> the other thing over here in green is actually the road. Now, in this particular instance, we have a little cliff over here, and you can see the rocks straight away bounce over and continue further down. Whereas over here, the little uh, bluff is much smaller and the terrain is ever so slightly flatter. What you can see, that actually the model predicts <coughs> that this road, even if it's only in this case six meter wide, will stop the majority of the rocks, okay? So this is the thing which we need to do, okay? Now what does it look like in the real world? Again, if you actually form some over here, although people haven't raised their hand, or you own this particular house, again, don't panic. Now, this is the run of data we used in November last year 
when we were looking at this study, okay? So the data at the moment is being processed. I don't have the latest photos. As much as I would love to actually show you what Littleton looks like in the colorful plots, I don't have it. Littleton is being done in the next uh, week or two, okay? What you have in a suburb of scale, in red, it's essentially area, if you would stand there, a lot of rocks would pass you. If you stand in a gray area, you can see them passing somewhere else in very broad terms. So the first thing the study gives is actually how often the boulders go through a particular area. And this actually identifies the rockfall corridors, okay? Now there's no ambiguity because it's actually modeled on the terrain and actually inputs the geology on it as well. So whether a boulder just flies and bounces or starts to roll depends on the conditions on the ground, which is one of the input parameters. I have to admit, this presentation essentially reduced to four slides from about 160. So I've omitted some detail, okay? In the individual areas, what you can actually see, that is looks like a shower, but there are distinct corridors over here. So for example, over here, there's a little bluff over here, and the model predictor is a lot of boulders should be coming down here, and there should be a lot of boulders coming down here, but relatively little done over here, okay? So that's what the model predicts. Obviously, the next thing we need to check, does it fit with reality, okay? Now, same area, just a slightly different um, elevation. And before we go further, I'm just going to explain on this picture what we see over here. Now, in gray and black, these are the individual buildings, the flatland, which is uh, the Sumner um, area, and then the hills above it. In little pink over here, we actually have the individual boulders that were actually recorded that fallen down. So from your boulder database, which you take it down, you can see the individual <coughs> blobs. Again, the blobs are just data points. They don't relate to the size of the blocks, okay? But so this says, look, there should be actually a lot of boulders over here, and the model actually in dark red shows over here there should be actually a lot of them. The other thing it shows in green is the runout area. So it says actually, look, these houses over here are unlikely to be hit as the model was run in November, okay? So we can actually determine where the boulders run to and then compare it with reality. Now, if you look at over here, and I selected this picture specifically, if you look at this area, you can see the uh, points and the colors actually agree quite well. So it's not that we actually tweak the model to actually suit the results. It's been run clean and then compared to reality. And that's the best way to actually run these models, okay? The other thing is actually would say, well, that's fine, but I mean, you predict here rocks, and there's actually none over there. You're right. No one was keen to go to that particular area, okay? So the data hasn't been recorded in this area. Subsequently, after December, we actually did send our team out there, and rocks were actually dead, uh, were found in there, okay? So that's some of the reality check which we do. Now, look, apart from having nice pictures, what does it give you? How does it feed into the policy? I found, yep, my house is being striked, you know, hit by a rock. Because most of you with the section one to four, you probably realize that either something came past you or hit your house, okay? So that's not necessarily the information we want to give to you only. What we do do, we actually look at, again, Vague Filaf as an example, and actually do then a more detailed analysis and see if I just lodge a rock from this point, where does it run to, and not necessarily where does it run to. In order to protect it or think, can I protect this? Can I put a bunt or a fence or can I mesh it at the ground fence? I need to see how much umph this has, how much energy is coming down with, which is the plot down here. So if the rock is falling out of this little bluff over here, initially for the first 50 meters, it has really, really high energies because it's flying. It's bouncing and every so often touching the ground. But then as the terrain starts to flatten out, it starts actually to roll. And as it rolls, it starts to lose a lot of energy because it's in contact with the ground, okay? So from the energy point of view, actually this is the area somewhere in here where you would consider a rockfall protection measure. 
The other thing which you need to consider is not necessarily how much oomph they are. If the fence is a meter high and they're coming at eight meter height, it's not much use either, okay? So the next input parameter you need to have is essentially how high do they bounce, how big is the roll. And that's the slide over here, which is an input, uh, sorry, an output out of the studies. So initially, they go somewhere in the order of three meters, but then once the terrain flattens out, again, they start to roll out. And that was one of these first things which you said, hang on, protecting at source, which we, was done prior to the 13th of June, which is actually a really good practice. You don't want to try to catch them, you want to treat them at ground, it's actually not very effective. If you have 1, 2G acceleration, then actually the rock comes out with its mesh still attached to it, okay? So we actually have to dislodge them in certain instances, let them roll, lose the energy, and then stop them, okay? So these are some of the data which will feed into the policy stream and essentially say, like, look, can I technically provide for this? And the added layer of complexity, which is not shown over here, is if I consider, for example, a fence in this position, generally fences are designed for alpine conditions, not for marine conditions, as we have down here. So the rust faster, so the longevity is not there. And the second thing is, if you do protect, you actually protect it for a very long period of time. If they have to replace them every 15 years, it's an additional ongoing capital cost. So these are some of the information which we actually do need. The other thing which we do realize is, if I'm just protecting this Wakefield Avenue, it's about two kilometers of protective works. Great, there's another 14 kilometers of ridge line, okay? Can I do it? How much is it going to be in terms of quantum cost? Is there actually enough fences at the moment in the world to be able to produce, implement, and build in a timely manner? So all this information we will get. If you remember the timeline, we, was, we said that these studies will start to feed our outcomes by the end of this month, so in the next three weeks. Okay? So that's the timeline you have seen. Now, what do they look like? Very simply, this is a picture I took from Italy. So this is a six meter high fence from Ringnet right in the middle of a forest and down at the bottom is a state highway or similar thing to a state highway. This is a similar picture taken from Switzerland. Again, a four meter high fence above a road. And this is a picture taken from a community hall which is directly underneath it, another six meter high slide of different fence. So that's what a fence looks like, okay? But Although a lot of people think, oh, look, that looks like a deer fence or something so fancier than that. These are actually specific engineering structures. These structures are fully tested with impact tests. There's only one testing facility in the world who can actually do this type of testing, which is actually in Switzerland, okay? And it's not that you test just the mesh or just the ports and just the anchor. And the entire system has to work. And that complexity, again, the port hills, these things are designed to hit one boulder catch one boulder per individual segment. Now we get more than one boulders coming down here after major earthquakes, which adds the complexity, okay? The other thing which we do, which are earth bunds. So there's reinforced earth bunds. This one is about a four meter high fence. This one is a three meter high fence. And this one is a rock catch fence, which is about 18 meter tall. But the rock fall source is all the way up there, and this is essentially a rock sleeve, so the, the rocks do bounce, and um, there was one actually impact from the other side about 18 meters into the air. So I've, I've shown these ones just for what we can build as engineers, not necessarily what we want to implement over here, okay? So this is some of the engineering background, but as Roger said, all of these things feed into the policy decision-making stream, which we're working on at the moment, okay? So what Jan's really talking about is you can look at a slope and try and make a judgment about where a rock might go and say, so, look, the rocks last time ended up here, therefore we better red zone these houses and these houses and white zone these areas. What we're trying to do here is much more sophisticated than just looking. They're building a really fancy computer model that digitises, turns it all into digital information what a slope looks like and then works out where the rocks would go depending on how hard the soil is, where the ridges are and all that other stuff. So it's quite sophisticated stuff to get it as precise as possible and work out how much risk people are actually exposed to, if risk at all. So that's what we're trying to do. 
So look, in terms of the summary from my bit of the little bit of the presentation is we, we wanted that timeline. We want to get this done by the end of June. And as Jan says, hopefully we'll have information to get some rezoning done reason up before the end of June. And you're all optimistic, folks. You're all thinking you're all going to be fixed by, you know, within a couple of weeks. Well, it's just the opposite of that. By definition, if you've come to this meeting, you'll be the last. Because just just the way life is, isn't it? So far, so far, all we've done is turn places green because we haven't done anything more than that. Anything more sophisticated than that, we haven't yet completed what that work will be. So I think some people are saying, actually, I want to go purple, which is I want to be bought out and I'm on the hills. We, we, we've heard that message. We haven't made, the government hasn't made a decision, that's what will happen. And we've made those decisions, we'll announce them. That work, we, we, we've got a commitment, we want to get all that policy work done by the end of June. Governments like making decisions about spending money and doing that stuff with more information rather than less information. So the government will tend to want information as complete as possible before it makes decisions. But yeah, we are aware people are, are fed up in many cases. Eh? So look, we are here to communicate, and we don't necessarily know the right ways of communicating, but we think these meetings are a good way of doing it. But we're also putting this up on the web. Um, but you, wanna, you need to tell us what we haven't answered tonight at the end of the meeting. You know, we're here for you, and you need to tell us what works well and what doesn't work well, whether we explain well enough what LIDAR is or whether we're just, you know, going too, too fast for you. Um, yeah, just continuing the, uh, the dialogue on communications, I see a lot of familiar faces from the uh, various street meetings that we held. And the street meetings were really focused on those folks with Section 124 notices and their immediate neighbours and uh, trying to keep the dialogue going with what we knew when we knew it. And uh, now we're into a different phase or we're starting to move towards a different phase. Those meetings were trying to handle the questions about the science even while the science was developing with the work of the geotechs in the field. Now we're into the Sarah-led uh, white zone meetings and we're very happy to be uh, included in those and we're starting to have a dialogue uh, led by Sarah around the policy implications of that science. Policy needs to be determined. They just did that for a laugh, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Good joke, okay, I get it. Uh, so um, so the, uh, the, the, the policy needs to be informed by the science. Sarah and Council will continue working together to keep you informed with the series of meetings, as Roger talked about, the skirt sessions uh, on retaining wall issues coming up next week. And uh, certainly council uh, will play its role within those meetings as. And uh, the, the, the message is here, you've heard it before, okay? There's not gonna be any new content here as far as that's concerned. Uh, we are stressing the fire risk with properties, we've had a lot of weather. There's a lot of fuel on properties. Please take care of the fire risk for your properties where it is safe to do so. Obviously with the uh, cliff collapse zones, not advised. But you are the best folks as property owners to know exactly what needs to take place on your properties to control the amount of fuel there uh, for burning. The ground truthing, as we've heard, is well underway, and that's really the beginning of getting your Section 124 notices resolved one way or the other. The ground truthing is going to identify the three results, either Section 124 could be removed, or it's a, uh, it's a result of just not an acceptable level of risk at all, or uh, some remedial works will need to take place before we could consider uh, removing the Section 124. And how do we transition into that where works have to take place and allowing some level of risk uh, and folks going back into their properties. So that's what the ground truthing is leading to. 100% rates remission for the folks with Section 124. So hopefully you are all aware of that. There are some contact details for that, 941-8999, if you are not benefiting from the 100% rates rebate for your Section 124 properties. As I said before, working together to reach decisions, and Council is 
especially thankful for the help of Sarah in this. I know that Dr. Kupek has been a very, um, very large influence on the Port Hills Geotech group, both at the table with the geotechs uh, in their twice weekly meetings, but also out in the field with the geotechs. Uh, quite a leadership figure in that capacity, very much appreciated. And also the 3D modeling. I don't think we can put too much emphasis on that and what a good thing that is. And Sarah has commissioned that work. That is going to speed the design and the decision making around remedial works significantly. And it is a, a very good piece of work for us to have been brought to the table by Sarah. Just a few comments on retaining walls before, again, uh, next week, Monday the 12th, and also again on Thursday the 15th. A couple of meetings on with Skirt talking about the publicly owned retaining walls, and I think EQC is going to be there as well to be able to uh, talk about, it seems just every other retaining wall is half publicly owned, half privately owned, or we actually don't know who owns it because nobody's really sure what side of the property line it is on. Those are a lot of complex issues, and is it actually a retaining wall or is it a facade? It's very deep, and I think really it's a subject um, worthy of its very own session. So please, if you do have those concerns, issues with retaining or facades, please do come along to that. Skirt is managing the repair of those publicly owned retaining walls. Their menu, they have a very long list that they are working on. And they are going just as quick as they can. And uh, obviously, as before with the, the highways, the more significant the road, uh, the higher up the list it probably is as far as works that's going to be taking place. It's an unfortunate fact. If you're well off the beaten track, then you've got a bit of time uh, ahead of you. So far, 116 publicly owned walls have been identified for repair, and that's quite a menu. I would suggest probably an awful lot of that is here in Littleton. Just changing the subject a little bit here, talking about consents. Um, if you are putting together uh, repairs and starting to think about that uh, with your insurers, uh, the council will process any consent application presented to it. Uh, just because it may be in a white zone does not mean that the council is going to sit on that. We are bound by the Act, the Building Act, to process your consents, and if you submit it, we will process it. It is a matter for you to take up with your insurer as far as the timing of that work, and you have to consider the idea, well, do I want to have a consent and pay for those fees if I still have a potential of some other sort of decision coming down um, a little bit later in the piece, so you need to be aware of your own situation. Why would you need a consent? A lot of repairs for your weather-tight features, the, uh, the, the cladding and the roofing, um, they won't always require a consent, but do talk to the council about that requirement, talk with your insurer. Rest assured, all of that work on the exterior and your roof uh, your cladding systems, you, and also the structural issues within your home will require licensed building practitioner. That's the build it right advertising that we've seen, the changes coming in as of the 1st of March this year. You need to have build, licensed building practitioners doing that work. And it is the homeowner's responsibility to make sure you can ask who's doing the work, I want to see your licensed building practitioner card, all right? And that's for the structural issues uh, and also retaining. Some of the trickier questions around consents, and this is why it pays to talk to the council if, if you're looking for some advice on that. If you're replacing just a few sheets of jib board in your house, probably doesn't require a consent. Not gonna be a lot of bracing issues with that. That's fine. If you are replacing a significant amount of your jib board, then you're starting to open up a can of worms as far as the bracing within that structure. And you may very well want to have that bracing redone uh, and be thinking about a building consent so that it can be done correctly. It's also worth noting that the building code is, is the absolute minimum 
The building code is not a standard to achieve and then go no further. The building code, and it's true in my own house, I wish I had done some extra bracing years ago when we built, would have benefited us now. So the, the, the bracing, you can go past the building code, be thinking about those sorts of issues, talk to the council if you want to get some advice on that, engage with your insurer as far as repairs and the people that they are uh, lining up to do that work. We have a relationship building with the insurance companies and their um, project management offices. Most of you will be aware EQC has engaged with Fletcher's and we have a very good working relationship with Fletcher's using some new technology to speed up the consents, the exchange of information within those consents that we are processing. AMI insurance is using Aero International and a lot of the other insurers have project management offices that they are using, and they are all moving to the same technology. Council has its own uh, software, it's called Aconex. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. And we are finding that it is speeding up the consents for those project management offices. So be aware that we are fronting with the PMOs to try to make your consents just as quick as we can. One last point on existing use rights. You may, as an example, have a two-story house. Uh, maybe your neighbors had a two-story house and you're looking at a total rebuild or significant repairs, interfering with the roof lines, whatever. You have existing use. Council wants you to have back what you had before. And so if you are in a rebuild scenario and you had that uh, intrusion, uh, the, the particular roof line, whatever the height was, possibly was casting a shadow over your neighbor's property or your neighbor was casting a shadow over yours considering recession planes. If that structure was built before the various city plan changes were made, then you have existing use rights and we want you to have that back. If you are looking at changing that, in other words, casting new shadow on your neighbor, or your neighbor is considering casting new shadow on your property, or encroaching on the boundary, or possibly you're encroaching uh, into the, uh, the setback at street level, whatever was in place before, we want you to have that back. If you are exceeding or going beyond that, then you could be looking at resource consent issues, all right? And you would need to be considering that. It's a lot easier not to go through that process, but that's a decision for you to be aware of you may need to make. All right, so existing use rights are in place. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bruce Empson. I'm um, working with EQC. I've got a couple of my colleagues here. God, the room's filled up. I've been had my back to you. Wow. Um, a couple of my colleagues are here who will help me. They're more expert in some of the topics. If we make the point... Next week, Monday and Thursday, there will be specific conversations around retaining walls led by Skirt, but we'll be there. This moves between individual and public, so we'll try and resolve that for you then. Just a quick comment to the Earthquake Commission. Um, as much as you might find us frustrating to deal with, and I, my chairman, hence the tie, made that comment in front of the Select Committee this morning, we have been frustrating to deal with. We're trying to deal with that. Before September 4th, 2010, there were 20 people, 22 people actually in Wellington, that was the Earthquake Commission. Um, at one point I think we topped out at 2200 and we're running somewhere around 1200 at the moment. That's simply the size and scale of the event. As Roger said earlier, nothing like this has been experienced in the world before. Um, large earthquakes, yes. Four, five, six of them large earthquakes, no. And the fact we've had 10,000 in the last how many ever months um, is unfortunately for us unique. Um, Earthquake Commission, however, is something we should all be grateful that exists. I personally am, for my own circumstances. Nowhere else in the world do we have effectively a government agency that underwrites insurance. So if you're not aware, you have three lots of cover. And if you haven't put in your claim since December 23rd, I urge you to do that or put in a claim. The reason is simple. You get cover against each event from the EQC for your land, which is unique. Nowhere else in the world is land insured. I'll talk about land a little bit further. Your building and your contents, which is a little bit unique as well, and that's a lot unique. So you get $20,000 of cover from the EQC for your contents, up to $20,000. You 
You get up to $100,000, so we're the primary insurer on your building, and then there is land cover, and the insurance model on that is as complex as you can imagine, and I'll need some help to describe it to you. But if I can, just take a minute or two, and I know you've got lots of questions. If I push this one, is that right? Just talk about land. So the EQC covers land remediation, and this is a very important point. The cover under the Act, and this is a, a, an Act of law, um, we are required to bring your land back to the state it was before September the 4th. So it's back to what it was then. Yeah? And we pay for land under your building and within eight metres of the dwelling. So your home. So your section might be considerably larger, like the screen, and the area of the slide is where your, your dwelling is, so we cover under the dwelling, the footprint, and an area within eight metres of the building, or there are some ancillary buildings, they look like garages and I think something else. Reed, garden sheds, thank you very much. Um, which also give you a footprint. And then there's another piece that's covered and it says the crow flies 60 metres from the house to the road, so your driveway. The reason I'm making this point is the EQC's land cover is not your whole section. It's the piece that's specific to the dwelling and your driveway. Right. Now land settlement. So I'm in a good position to be able to tell you my board has made a decision. So we're an agency, not a department. As Roger, Sarah is a government department. We're a government agency, so we have a separate board. But we enjoy the same minister as Sarah. So Minister Brownlee is the minister for EQC and Sarah. Um, the board's made a decision that effectively says we will ca cash settle as many land claims as possible. Headline number for you, we've done 88,537 land assessments. So when you make a claim and you indicate there's land damage, so you tick that box, we've done 88,537 land assessments in addition to 462,000 uh, building and contents assessments. So if your house and land is damaged, so we're going to try and cash out as much as possible. So there's lots of land damages. So we've in fact categorised nine sorts. The first seven are relatively simple. They look like cracks, splits, ponding, undulation, the sorts of things largely that we can do ourselves. And lots of that will be done ourselves. In my own home, I'll end up doing it, I guess, with a lawnmower, as I always have. Um, there is two other sorts that are a little more complex. That's around... Um, exacerbated flood exposure, so where the land has moved up or down relative to flood plains, Council's working on that, and then there's liquefaction, so exposure to liquefaction. Now there's a piece of work being, is going on at the moment, peer reviewing the work that's been done. So we've got three international experts right now peer reviewing the model that's been applied, and then we hope to be making some announcements within the next four to six weeks around the land settlement process. So we'll be running some public meetings to share that with you as we go forward. It's very close. However, start again. Largely we're going to settle land with cash, so we'll pay you. If your house and the land damage, if the house is damaged and the land damage is affected by it, then, and if you're in our PMO, that is with Fletcher's, it's more than likely that the land will be repaired along with the house repair. And I would suggest that's fair to say, although I can't say it for the other insurers, if you're in the, with the insurer for repair, that we will be working with the insurer to facilitate the repair of the land as they repair the house. Yeah. If you choose to opt out of the PMO process, then the repair of the land will be to your account. You'll do it yourself, along with the repair process. Yeah. I, hear some, I can hear some questions coming. One on retaining walls, as we said, we've all, all said um, there's specific retaining wall meetings, but I thought it was important that we share this with you tonight. Now, the word indemnity. EQC provides indemnity cover for retaining walls, not replacement cover. Indemnity cover says the value of the land against its, the, of the wall against its original construction price depreciated over time. So if your retaining wall was built 50 years ago, the indemnity value will not be very high. 
Again, this is Act driven, so this is not something that is discretionary for EQC, this is within the rules of the Act. That means we pay out the value of the wall when it was damaged, not the cost of building a new wall. And there are also specific pieces about how much of the wall is covered relative to its exposure to your home. So if the wall runs right down a fence which doesn't, and oh, sorry, around, it, around your property, and there's a specific piece that's retaining against the dwelling, then that's covered by the Act. The other element, which is potentially your garden or where the kids trampoline goes, may not be. So hence we want to have these specific conversations about retaining walls because it is so critical in Middleton. Now some insurance companies provide top-up cover for retaining walls and I urge you before these conversations next week to check with your own policy, read your own policy to see whether your insurance company provides top-up cover for retaining walls. Some don't. So it's important we understand that or you understand that with your own circumstances before we get into these conversations. No jokes. So that's all I wanted to share tonight. Um, but I can repeat, Skirt are running these two retaining wall sessions next week. We'll be there so that we can make sure the interface between private, public, who owns them can be discussed and debated. <coughs> and as was suggested earlier, I've got two colleagues with me. Um, if you've got specific questions relative to your own claims, happy to stay behind and try and answer them. If we can't do that, We'll take your concern away and respond to you within a matter of days. That's all I've got. Look, the, this is a really complicated answer, and I'm trying to actually answer it chronologically, okay, with time. Um, after February, February was seen as a rare event, you know, very high acceleration. No one expected that. One out of the box, no one expected that again, another one. So the Principle was, let's go to the top of the hill, fix what's broken, and be happy with that, okay? June comes along, and we suddenly see that the rocks which we might have fixed, some of them actually failed or moved, so it's actually not good enough in terms of what has been done. Equally, so the stuff which was assessed as being fine got thrown out again, and failed as part of being assessed. So the whole method, how we actually looked at these hills, we actually took the book, burned it, how to do it in the rest of the world, and developed our own books, okay? So that took the painful couple of months, collecting data, developing it, okay? So a lot of the stuff was stopped for fixing things above private areas, but the work has continued about lifelines, which comes back to Roger. If you actually do drive out of the tunnel, out, have a look up over your left shoulder. There's a lot of um, rockfall protection in place already, and it actually was um, hit several times since by earthquake and by natural rocks, and actually stopped it very effectively, okay? So that's the answer to the question. Well, just also to add to that, I know that there was some thinking that uh, in a few sites uh, there was thinking that the council had run out of money or had just stopped paying people, and that's not the case at all. It was the viability of the works that had been done that was called into question on June 13th, but then there did have to continue some immediate urgent works on lifelines and immediate risk issues. Those works continue to a point when that requirement was satisfied and then stopped. Both of the studies, both the SARA study and the GNS study, need input data to feed into it. Otherwise, we just have a black box spitting something which doesn't make sense, okay? So one of the fundamental input data is, where are rocks? Where do they end up? So that data was collected first of um, utmost to actually feed in both of the studies, okay? The other thing which was collected while people were on the port hills is so looking between the rock source at the hill and where it ends up, what does the terrain look like? Is it like more rocky where it's likely to bounce? Is it more swampy where it's more likely to be arrested? What's the terrain? And all this information has been uh, taken into account. The other one is, what does actually the source look like? Because if you look up over the hill, you can see distinct layers and bluffs. And the question is, is it this bluff shedding rocks the size of my head, the size of my, a washing machine, the size of a car, the size of a bus? 
all this information feed into it, okay? So the maps you have seen is just one layer, which I just pulled out of the database to visualize what input parameters go through the black box, which then spits out the actually where rocks will end up, okay? So, so Jan, can I say then that all that sort of that fancy modeling work that's going on at the moment, either by GNS people or in universities in Europe, the work they're doing is taking in all the inputs that are available from both, you know, fancy modelling of what the terrain looks like, what the hillside looks like, to the ground truthing work, all possible inputs are going into that. So we're not, well, it's not just a compu computational model, it's a model which is taking as many smart inputs as possible. Is that right? Yep. Is that, is that really, that's what we're really asking, isn't it? Yeah. And it is you, you use a human impact as well. So we don't just rely on an electronic black box to spit out what happens yeah. to your house. The ground through thing is to send human beings out there, specialists in there, to make a judgment call. So, and also, are we also, I think I've also asked Jan about this as well, but I'm just going to play like I haven't asked it before. <laughs> um, when we've, we've seen where rocks have already gone, are we... Are we checking that the model is tuning, tuning out results, which is consistent with what we've physically seen in the field as well? Correct. Yeah. But, and that's one of the slides I've just shown. It's no point running the models and it doesn't match reality. So what I said, we run the models clean, see what happens, and what the reality corresponds with the model outputs. And that's uh, one of the reasons which I probably have mentioned in the year. We selected Wakefield Avenue, not necessarily because we just randomly picked Wakefield Avenue, but Wakefield Avenue, to a certain uh, degree, represents the entire Port Hills in our smaller scale. We have little bluffs, we have run-out areas, we have different sources shedding different type of rocks. We have at risk a lifeline, which is the heavy haulage hood. We have different houses. It's flat at the bottom, sloping at the bottom. So Wakefield Avenue is actually the small scale model. So what works over there will work over here. But it's, we always rerunning it and checking, okay? And that's the reason for the two maps. So it's not one single, we have redundancy in the system. Right, I'll just follow up on, on Roland's question earlier. Just um, with what you've seen coming out of the models and your experience on the ground, it seems like you're kind of suggesting that control measures are gonna be more effective in the runout zone rather than up at the source. Is that, is that a fair way to put that? Um, that's the moment of the thinking, yes, but we're talking about largely distributed sources, mm -hmm. like an entire bluff several hundred meters long, 50 meters high, okay? If it's a point source, which I haven't again shown over here due to length, you can identify individual point sources and see what they affect. If you treat this source and take it out of the model, how does it change the entire model down at the bottom? So if you strategically take bits out and treat them at the source, what does it change? And that's very valid what you can do. If they have one big block, which actually threatens 10 houses, you take that one out, everything is fine. So, so what you're saying, Jan, is we've got a whole lot of rocks here, and more down here, and something over here. We're trying to work out the most effective place to put any protective yep. measure. And because that's quite complicated, you know, you might think we'll put them at every level, but maybe we're going to put them in one place. So it's just all that coming yeah. together, isn't it? And obviously, what type of protective measures would we select to be at that site? A fence is relatively effective at sleep terrain, but you can't get to it because you have to have footprint to actually put the bond into it. So a lot of these decisions are actually balanced against each other. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I got a question. Uh, uh, some of the properties after 10,000 quakes have not experienced any rockfall at all. Why are we still in the white zone? Yep, that's a good question. Uh, we have an entire section of the GNS report on that specific issue because we would say, look, I have a house, nothing came past me, we have 10,000 earthquakes. The problem is uh, uh, twofold. First of all, not every earthquake will trigger that particular rock. What we have seen, earthquakes are very directive. Something coming from east-south, uh, so east-west, will do nothing, and then you turn it 90 degrees, and suddenly things happen. And that's a one, a one answer. The second one is, we don't believe necessarily that the earthquake we have had is the worst case event. And the natural rate of, and I'm just saying this because you cannot assume this is the worst case event, 
Okay, there are historic events were in the past which actually have indicated much larger event happened in the past. And that's the way this volcano over here, which we call a home, five million years ago to two million years ago was active, and then since then actually become inactive. Well, okay? If you follow that so, through, we'll never get out of the white zone. <laughs> no, that's not true. Let me just... The other thing which we actually do is we see what is the largest possible boulder that you can do to, and we can protect against it. The question for you, you probably have, will my home be forever safe? There will be always a residual risk remaining. This is the message both Ethan and myself have given uh, the residents in the street level meeting. No protective works will ever be safe. But after 10,000 quakes, if you haven't had any rock fall, I think that's a fair indication that the, the percentages are fairly low. Why are we still in the white zone? Uh, if I can just jump in a little bit there. Um, an even better question is some of the Section 124 properties haven't been impacted by rocks either. And what is the basis for that? And what's the answer? And the answer for that is that the observed field data and the science as applied by the geotechs in the field has identified the risk. And just because there may not be a rock in that particular instant doesn't mean that the level of risk isn't so great with the understanding of the science in the field that that property is not at some level of risk in the case of a section 124. There are many properties two, three doors down that have been impacted by a rock and it was just roulette as to who got it that time. I think there's some GNS experts who will disagree with what you said. Okay. Yeah. Can I take that one stage further, building on both the two previous speakers? When you go and do the ground truthing in the field, um, you know where the rocks have ended up and you hazard a guess as to where they've come from, but you don't know the track that they followed. How, when you find a discrepancy between the model and what you believe you see on the ground, what do you alter? Do you alter your assessment or do you alter the model? Okay, it's a good question, and uh, you probably do both. Because the first thing what you actually do is, you set up with a model which you do know is actually correct from a certain area. The very moment you find a discrepancy as you just described, okay, you actually have to question, first of all, is the model output correct, and have I put the right things into it? So it's actually both of them what you need to do, okay? And what you actually need to assume is, is this side we are assessing at this particular moment where discrepancy occurred different to the side where the model was set up? This, and th in this particular instance, it will come down to judgment. Okay? So the judgment outweighs the model? Always will. In that case, do you have a problem that you will end up with a... a signature on the decision instead of a model generated decision during the ground through thing it's being done by two senior engineering geologists the geotechnical engineers co-signing the one paper which actually goes for the ground through thing it's not one person and it's not the junior grad just dropping out of the school yesterday it's actually people who have been doing this job for the last decade this specific job okay thank you So that's traced a lot of into policy decisions, okay? And the quick answer is we haven't done these decisions yet, okay? Because the situation you have in particular is, is consists of many, many other properties. So the studies will actually give us how big is the problem, okay? And that will, uh, that will deal with the next question you had, how long? Okay, what Roger said, we don't know how long. We don't know the stage whether a week is too short, 10 years too late, okay? Who so, makes that decision? 
Who makes that decision about what will be too long? Yeah. Well, I think that's a decision we'd have to make talking to, to local communities. I, I mean, we, have, we haven't actually had to make a decision like that so far. The decision we've made around the red zone stuff on the flatland was if you're in somewhere like Bexley, we're going to have to build enormous dams, raise the land up. People wouldn't have to be able to go back to their houses for sort of four or five years from now. And we think that is clearly too long. And I don't think we've had a whole lot of... Well, there's actually some pushback from some communities saying, actually, I actually I love the US so much I do want to go back. But I think in general people think five years is, is too long. Much more than that. Or yeah. What do they honestly? What do, what do you all really expect all of us to do? I mean, seriously. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think. I mean, no. I mean, there'll be, there'll be some people here. I mean, everyone is under financial stress here. If you're out of your house, there's no yeah. question about no, that. Right. But then there are just people who have different, you know, different appetites for wanting to go back into the houses or not. Some people say, look, actually, just give me the money. I've, I've had enough. I want to move on. But for other people, and that's often we're seeing in these sorts of areas, but the Brooklyns and those sort of places which are special, they're saying actually I can't get anything like that again, so I'm, I'm willing to be a bit patient and that's going to be hard for us. You know, some of these Brooklyns meetings, you know, there are people saying, look, I just love being able to walk out my front door with my white batting net and going out and doing it, so please let me come back. And then there's people who stand up at those and say, well, actually, I've got a three-year-old and I don't want to wait a year. I don't want to wait two years. I want to get on with my life. And I don't, I don't have an answer for you here tonight on that. So, so I think, I think, I mean, I, I, we haven't made that decision, but in the red zoning decisions we made in the flatland, an important input was the fact people couldn't, we didn't think they'd get long-term insurance cover. Um, but if you've got a house, but I think that the, 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 issue, the insurance issue won't be as difficult as that, because the thing on the flatland, you know, the chances are the houses getting damaged in another shake was pretty high. You know, in any year might be a one in twenty chance or one in thirty chance they're going to get, you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. My gut reaction is, let's make up a number. If you had a one in a thousand chance of getting a rock through your house, then a one in a thousand chance of getting twenty thousand dollars worth of damage, in very simple terms, is going to add twenty dollars a year to your premium. So, in that case, I would have thought the insurance company is probably still going to be happy to be there. Okay, thank you. That's really Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think that, I, and, that, and, and that's actually an important distinction. You know, the flatland, the insurance companies are just running a mile because it just looks so bloody ugly. In this case, it's not the insurance companies running away. It's more. It's more the people worrying about life risk are running a mile saying, Jesus, we just can't leave people living at that level of life risk. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I, we've talked about life risk, and I think I understand it at a very general level. So the, I presume some policy people or, or, or central government are going to make a decision, or perhaps council, make a decision that one in, you know, the figures you were um, throwing around, one in 500, one in 1,000, it's too great, can't, uh, we can't accept that as a risk for people to live in their house. So I assume then the, um, the logical answer to that is a red stickered. But it also seems to me there's other things you're going to have to decide that's not just about life risk. There's going to be some very pragmatic decisions made. So maybe one in 1,000, yes, so we can live with that but it's going to cost X millions to remediate and therefore the life risk isn't the fact that it's the practical... Well, that's, that's right. I mean, there are a whole lot of things that come in there. I mean, one is that, as you say, the life risk. You know, and people write international studies about what sort of life risk is acceptable and unacceptable and people will go off and that's being thought about at the moment. But as you say, also cost effectiveness of these measures as well. You know, I mean, standing up here now, I'd guess that if a fence could be built for make up a number $50,000 to protect a half million dollar house, that sounds pretty cost effective to me and it's just a matter of the parties, the resident, the guy who's got the land above the house, maybe the government, maybe the city council, working out how those costs are shared. But it would seem to me those costs are, will be sensible as a society if we find a way of solving those sorts of issues. But how those costs are divvied up, I, just, I can look you in the eye and say no decisions to be made if you all break into my office tonight you won't find anything in there saying we have made any decisions or there's even a whole lot of discussion about it. Is that okay? I, yeah. Thank you. Charlie's got the microphone. 
Oh, my question's about uh, capital values. Uh, being in a white zone has probably already, uh, already adversely affected the capital value of our properties because, of course, they're publicly notified these white zones. If in June we transition out of those white zones and we pass them to the equivalent of a green zone, will there be a permanent public record that we were at one stage in a white zone and therefore likely at risk? And would that adversely uh, affect our property values in perpetuity? And flip side of the coin, if you transitioned into the equivalent of a red zone, would we be paid out at 1997 uh, should I say 2007 property values as opposed to 2012? Are we going to be five years behind, given that it's going to take at least 18 months to resolve this issue from uh, September? Yeah, in, ter in terms of the, the first bit of the question, um, yeah, sorry, I'll let Ethan answer that. I'm not hiding. Thank you, uh, Roger. Do yeah. you want me to go, Ethan? <laughs> um, sorry. I was on the so, very so early flight to Wellington this morning, eh? It's been a long day, eh? <laughs> I was going to let him have a go. Uh, Section 44A of the Local Government Official Information Act deals with LIMS, Land Information Memoranda. That requires the council to, dis to disclose what it knows about a property. It also requires the council to disclose any notice issued by a regulatory body, a government agency, et cetera, et cetera. White zone, my interpretation right now is that is not a notice issued by any authority. Unfortunately, a section 124 notice is, and that would have to be disclosed on the limb. The answer to that is the work that is going on right now, which, okay, there was that because of geotechnical hazard, but equally on the limb when we then know the results of the science will be the remarks around the results of the investigation, the various reports, et cetera, et cetera, that sits as a reply, if you will, a counter to that section 124. And there's no way for us to avoid that. I guess just on, on the flatland, the issues arisen in the flatland, people with these different property gradients, TC1, TC2, TC3. So the issues sort of was arising there as well. And there, if you like, the thrust has been to try and get as much information out there as possible. So let's say if you're on one of these TC3 land, which is considered to be you know, the, the poorer quality of the three categories, if your land is tested you know, professionally and you find you're actually only TC2 land, that information would also go on the limb. So people would actually see what that land quality was. So we're trying to build as much of a database as we can. In terms of um, valuations for any buyout, I mean, it's just I mean, we haven't even decided that there will be a buyout. So... I can't answer that question. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm from Rapaki and uh, where were the, uh, the rocks come down and went through one of the houses. Um, and I'm just, uh, for you, Jan, I'm, I'm asking the question as to, you say you've taken things from Switzerland and Italy about what's happened over there. In the first earthquake on February the 22nd was when the rock went through the house by us, or beside me, it was my parents' house, old house. But um, the major one where we had the damage done around there was at the 117, and that was on the mountain above us where the rocks come straight out of the mountain. And in some cases, uh, there were five tonne rocks. They bounced like tennis balls, two bounces, and they were into my brother's house, who's over there. Um, and I heard Roger say before that. It, your chances are 101 of getting, a, or 1,000 to 1 of getting a rock in your house. Well, he got two in his house, so, yeah, so he done well. One of the, uh, the things... On that day, when it happened, um, and you, they've been up and done tests now, and there was 1,300 rocks that moved on that mountain. There was uh, 23 come down to the road, seven crossed the road. Um, one, two into houses... And, and the others sort of went side on. But I heard you also talk about um, fences and you also spoke about plateaus. Now, is it true that a plateau will take out 90% of the power if it hits a flat spot, if a rock hits a flat spot? And I would have thought that with the mountain that we would have around there being a different area, that plateaus would be better than fences because 
that last rock that went through into my brother's house no, comes straight over the top of a power line yeah. and drops straight in. Look, if you remember when I actually had the slide which shows Littleton, I actually specifically highlighted that Rapaki area had a specific geo, uh, GNS pilots that done on it as well because we do recognize that actually the boulder which went through the house was not 5 cubic meters, it was 15 cubic meters. Okay, so it was about 30 to 50 tons. Okay, no feints currently on the market or even experimental stage will be able to do this. There might be bunts, but no fans, okay? So that area is specific. So that's what I'm saying, how the GNS study fits, for example, in the 3D study. So when you do run the analysis on Rapaki, you use different input parameters than you would use, for example, in Habitat Avenue, because the source area is different, okay? So it's custom made to this area, and the solution will be different. And I guess we're also saying there may not be a solution there either. You know, and I guess we're, we're sort of maybe, we don't lead, lead you astray here tonight and say there are going to be solutions for everybody. There may not be. And if there aren't solutions, I don't know what the public policy, what the payout situation will be because simply no decision has been made. I'm not saying you won't be paid out. I'm just saying we haven't decided you will be. Is that okay? And I guess it's a bit well, of a danger of us. Yeah, we, we'll have, a, we'll have a, a discussion about where, where the, or how we go or where we go. To. Yeah, no, look, I, and I acknowledge that. All I'm saying is the it's government... A different I, I can't stand here telling that you will be paid out when the government hasn't decided to. I'm not saying they won't either. I'm just saying yeah. they haven't got... Yeah, I'm just asking. This is for you, Ethan, of course. <laughs> Medium risk rocks above a house. Why are people still out of their houses when, there's, when, the, um, when your own photo indicates our medium risk above those houses? I thought imminent risk is... Medium risk sort of got me thinking a wee bit. So this is the rocks that were worked on above your site? Um, well, no, the ones that weren't worked on are indicated in, in a picture from you fellas as green as, as medium risk, not imminent risk. The and one rock that was worked on above our place, yes, 100,000 spent on and I take it user happy it's fixed. What I can say is that any section 124 that is in place today is upon the advice of the Geotex and has been peer reviewed. So another group of people has looked at us. Well. The Geotex have given the advice for the placement of the section 124 and the council has acted on that. The Geotex are well aware of the work that has taken place and they have not advised the removal of the section 124. Um, the gentleman that talked about the uh, retaining walls uh, mentioned a, a rather frightening thing to me. You said the cost would be replaced uh, when they were built. Now, my retaining wall is probably 150 years old or something like that. It cost $100, £100. Uh, it's going to cost uh, $100, um, a f what, half metre now, to put a log wall down there. And just adding to that, it's my driver's slipping down and the cracks are appearing under the deck of the house. Now, I'm sliding into the pink zone. Um, am I going to get that wall done or do I have to pay for it? I'm a, a pensioner and I, I can never afford to fix that wall. I, I'm happy to talk about your case with you specifically, but I could come back to the, to the broad comment. The Act specifically refers to indemnity value. So indemnity value is not replacement value. So it's the original price depreciated over time. And that's, and that's why I raise it with you. This is not well known, and it's important that we understand it because this is not a replacement value insurance policy. So, so I mean, Bruce also knows about this because this issue, while it's a big issue in Littleton, you know, it's been a big issue you know, in other areas where they've had natural disasters as well, big flood events and those sorts of things. It's also done damage to retaining also. It's, it's an issue which has had to be dealt with in other places already, but yeah. Yes, it applies to Nelson right now. So all of the events in Nelson that have happened in December. But I think I think the best place for some of those sort of discussions yeah. will be at the the meeting talking about retaining walls on Monday. 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 So right. So. Yeah. Hi, um, I'd like to pick up on the point about Corsair Bay. Um, the original 
124 was one house. Eight more were added, if you remember, while the work was undertaken. And now you're saying that the reason they haven't been removed is because the geotechs have not come back to you to recommend they be removed. Do they know that they have the ability to come back and recommend removal right now? Um, because maybe Jan, could you answer that question? Do you, do your geotechs or do the geotechs know that they can take, uh, they can recommend removal of 124s right now? Because we've got eight extra red stickers in Corsair Bay that were only put on for the purpose of making the remediation, which has now been completed for the major rock and the other rocks are medium risk only, i.e. not imminent risk. If I can say, the Geotech, and I'll let Jan comment as well, the Geotech is well aware of the situation and is well aware that he can recommend the removal of the Section 124s. His decision on that is peer-reviewed within uh, the Port Hills Geotech group, so there is consensus for the re retention of those Section 124 notices. There are questions of imminent risk rocks and risk. Imminent is a much more critical nature and there is a lifeline impact there that that is not the only level of risk no, in, these in are place. These all medium risk. Can I, yeah. can I probably answer this myth about low, medium and imminent? First of all, I don't call them imminent because imminent is something which is the EQC Act and it refers only to actually something which happening within the next 12 months under natural conditions. Right? Good. Excellent. So when the geotechs were out with the iPads, with a piece of paper initially, we had to have a rating system how we did describe a rock likely to go off, okay? If these things were so wonky, they should actually breathe against it and they could go, they were high risk, okay? And that was essentially to uh, ensure that no one goes below them and works on it, okay? If they are medium risk, you probably actually would need something like an airbag or a crowbar to get them off. But it was okay for a short period of time to work on anything. You just had to watch it if there's a little aftershock, okay? Low risks just means this is a potential rockfall source. So the low, medium, and high does not relate how likely they are coming down under normal conditions. It is actually just for the people working on the hills, give an indication if they walk up to a site where someone else was working before and they see on the map with the blue dot where they are on their iPad, hang on, there is a high risk rock above us to indicate for them as a health and safety perspective, watch it, use a different path. So these classifications were not intended to see how likely it is in a large aftershock to come down, okay? Chunks of rock that have got big cracks in behind them, um, quite, you know, four or five metres back from the cliff edge. And I was just wondering how um, your model decides how big a piece yep. is going to come down the hill. How's yep. the model think about those sorts of yep. features? Yeah. So, again, for the input parameters, the geotechnical engineers go out there and they assess if what the geology is on the side. If you go to certain areas, you have this brecciated lava, it looks a bit more like a baked Weetabix with bits in it, all right? If that falls off, essentially disintegrates on Hetzal's boulders and they're being caught in the next shrub, okay? If you go more to the basaltic lava where they have these nice cooling joints, which looks like uh, the giant's causeway in Ireland, these things come down and actually turn themselves as you go inside, like a steamroller coming down, okay? So it's up to the geotechnical engineer to decide, based on his experience, what will peel off from these cliffs or this back in another large event or under normal conditions, like weathering. And when it does fall down, under which size of blocks it will actually disintegrate and then move down slope, okay? And that might be, again, if you were in the first 50 meters, the block size will be different than 100 meters further down. So all this one is beta observations. And we have had a look where blocks came down, how they disintegrated. We actually used video footage 
of rocks falling off. They dislodged hundreds of blocks into the little harbor further on to actually understand how this material from different sources breaks up when it hits other material on the ground. All this information as kinematic information feeds into the models into it, okay? I just quickly repeat the question. So the question was if the boulder ends up in your driveway, in your house, who's responsible in the bedroom? I see a couple of them in the bathroom actually end up in the house. Who's responsible to actually remove them? Okay? And then I put into two. Because it's not Sarah. <laughs> Is it Sarah? Um, it is going to go back to your insurer whether it's an EQC or a... I'm, I think, I'm baiting, I think, anyways. I think, I think look, so, so, let, me, let me, Roger. There you go. So that's, a, that, that's a good answer. I've worked it out. Um, so your insurance company covers you. If you're under the $100,000 cap, then EQC looks after it for you. If it's over the cap, then it's the insurance company. Now, there's a little twist here. Some of you may have heard of the, pro, the, of the, the phrase apportionment. Right. So, yeah, I've got to go there, no, Roger. Basically, no, basically what he says, your insurer should look after it. And your insurer your may be EQC or your insurance yeah. company. So that's where it's got to sort. We can't blow them up If you blow them up yourselves, your insurer's not going to insure your property. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a f final question from the back here, and then the floor will be open if anyone has any individual questions they'd like to ask the panel. Uh, yes, this is not just about uh, property, it's also about roads and transport. Can anyone give us information on the likes of the Summit Road and Evans Pass? I'll start with Summit Road. Uh, first of all, Summit Road is part of what we refer to as a lifeline or a heavy haulage route. Okay, So it's one of the uh, main arteries to get actually uh, bits that either don't fit through the tunnel or things that we just don't want to have in the tunnel across to Sumner and across. Okay, It was a major effort in the initial response to actually get this open. Okay, Problem with this one on Summit Road, which is for you who don't know what Summit Road is, or Sumner Road, is from here over to Evans Pass into Sumner. Now this particular area has failed repeatedly and in my opinion, very catastrophically. So we're not getting one or two boulders into it. We get the debris inundation in there. Lots of, lots of boulders coming in there, falling out. So there is at the moment the port, Christ City Council, skirt. I'm to some degree involved in this one. What actually are we going to do about this? And the question is, can we do something about this? Again, the point is, if you put just a fence in there, it's probably going to be useless given what we actually have seen. So it has to be a very specific idea. If you then go off to Summit uh, um, from Evans Spas, down to Sumner, the work at the moment is being undertaken to secure this route. And that route is actually another emergency route from Sumner via Summit Road and down Mount Pleasant. Because if you have another large aftershock and we may lose some of Peacock's Gallop, which is the single access road. We lose the principal access to Sumner and the communities around there. We have to actually have an emergency egress route. Out of Sumner, we have three emergency routes over Scarborough, Richmond Hill, and Clifton to get people up over the top and Summit Road. So the desk work is ongoing. And don't quote me, I think we're talking about the next six to eight weeks, possibly longer on physical works to secure this route, okay? It's the same people who do the ground through thing, and there's the same bunch of people who actually provide, uh, provide information through 3D. We can't get them, we tried cloning and sheep came out. Okay? <laughs> so there's only a limited there's only a limited number of resources with the specialty and the skills available in New Zealand and Australia which actually can do this type of work. Okay? 